Once around diamond planets. Diamond is, of course, a form of carbon, pure carbon with the atoms arranged in a three dimensional tetrahedral lattice, as shown on the left there, creating a very, very strong material, one of the hardest substances known in the universe. You can get other forms of carbon, graphite on the right hand side there with its flat sheets of hexagonally arranged atoms with gaps between the layers is much softer. And you can wrap that sort of structure around into a sphere, so-called buckyball, football-shaped molecules, and make other types of carbon that turn up in things like soot. But if we are going to make a planet of diamonds, we're going to need a lot of carbon. And we can't get it from the Big Bang, because the Big Bang left us with just three quarters hydrogen and one quarter helium, and a trace of anything else only. And most of that was lithium anyway, so no use to us. So it is to stars that we have to turn to get our carbon. Stars begin by fusing hydrogen to helium in their cores, the nuclear fusion releasing energy that resists the force of gravity and keeps them stable for a very long time. And larger stars are then able to generate enough pressure and temperature in the central core to convert some of the helium to carbon. It's a difficult process because you need to take three helium nuclei and ram them together to form one carbon. Helium is atomic mass four, carbon is 12. So three heliums make a carbon. You might think you would take two heliums and make a eight particle beryllium nucleus, but beryllium nuclei are unstable and fall apart again. Certainly beryllium eight is very unstable. And you can only proceed in that direction by taking two heliums to make a beryllium eight nucleus and very quickly hitting it with a third helium, making a carbon before the beryllium falls apart. But once you've made your carbon, you can add a fourth helium to it relatively easily and make oxygen. And that's because oxygen is very stable. It has a very good, strong binding energy as a result of having eight protons and eight neutrons. And eight in nuclear physics is a magic number. It fills up a whole orbital shell of nuclei. And uh, the uh, result is a very stable nucleus for oxygen. And so you can make carbon, but you tend to convert quite a lot of it into oxygen fairly easily. For that reason, hydrogen and helium are the first and second most common elements in the universe, and carbon and oxygen come next. But carbon turns out to be the fourth most common. You can see in the logarithmic trace of the element abundance of the sun there, that hydrogen and helium have the highest peaks, then carbon and oxygen are sticking up in the next little group, followed by a gradual decline for all the other elements. And the pie chart reveals it as well. Now, this pie chart is done by number of atoms rather than by weight. So the 25% by weight of helium um, represents a rather slimmer chunk due to the fact that helium nuclei weigh four times as much. But again, if we split out the, the sliver of everything else that is in the sun, just 1.8% of the sun is uh, other elements, and half of those are oxygen and nearly a quarter carbon with the other elements, neon, nitrogen, magnesium, silicon, iron, sulfur, shown there for the, the other ones that turn out to be quite common. But if we look at the Earth, we don't have very much carbon. Our crust is made of silicates, which is oxides of silicon bound to metals like aluminium, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and all the other metals as well. And the iron in the core mixed with nickel accounts for quite a substantial proportion of that. There are a few other elements mixed in there as well. So oxygen, silicon, sulfur, and so forth. But you don't see carbon turning up in there anywhere. Now, this is because when the solar system was young, 
the disk of material around the sun was being heated by the radiation coming from the sun, which had been forming by gravitational collapse and getting very hot. So there's a lot of heat coming away from it, even before it kicked off nuclear fusion in its protostar stage. And this protoplanetary disk around would have been subject to fractional distillation. That's where you heat a material and the more volatile compounds are boiled off first and move to much lower temperature regions before condensing. And so the interior of the solar system was only able to have materials survive in there that were the least volatile, so the, the metals and the silicate rocks. Further out, more uh, volatile compounds could uh, solidify. So uh, further out, you might get some of the methane and the ammonia coming back out as uh, liquid droplets and being able to be formed up into planets and so forth. And another way to look at this and describe it is to talk about the distance from the star for different things to condense out. So in the center, only minerals, rocks, metals, and so on. But if you go out beyond the point where the temperature drops a little bit, you can call that line the soot line, where carbon compounds such as um, carbon molecules, benzene, naphthalene, buckyballs, bits of graphite, and indeed bits of diamond could form and condense out as a solid. And then you go a little bit further out, you get cold enough for water and then ammonia and methane to condense out further out. So the distillation process creates these zones within the solar system. And so the Earth is well inside that rocky zone, and it's, uh, the soot line is round about where the asteroid belt is, and we get quite a lot of carbon-containing asteroids, the C-type asteroids, out in and around the region marked there in red, before you get to the very water-rich bodies further out, and indeed the giant planets where... Uh, even the hydrogen and the helium could accumulate. Now, this is not always the same distribution of elements in other parts of the cosmos. Near the center of the galaxy, we seem to see stars with a much higher ratio of carbon to oxygen, and also in some of the globular clusters. So uh, our piece of the uh, universe seems a little different to that which we find elsewhere in this respect. But if you have a decent amount of carbon and you're forming a planet beyond the soot line, then perhaps you would indeed be able to get a proper carbon planet, one where there is more carbon than oxygen as opposed to the other way around. And this would form where the protoplanetary disk is rich in carbon beyond the soot line and relatively oxygen poor. Um, now, if you did have a carbon planet, it would be quite difficult for us to tell the difference just from looking at the size and mass. Although if we did, we could possibly tell that it didn't have a metal core. Uh, that would increase its overall density. So somewhat difficult to tell. But if you can study these things with a spectroscope, then you can get a good idea of what they're made of. So. The atmosphere of such a world would likely contain lots of carbon. It would contain hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and perhaps even pure carbon dust, perhaps buckyballs and uh, soot particles generally in the atmosphere. But it would not have water. And this would be because if there uh, is an excess of carbon, the carbon binds with oxygen very ferociously, turning it into carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, rather than allowing the hydrogen to bond with it as water. And if the hydrogen is then, of course, absorbed by yet more carbon to give the hydrocarbons. So that list that we put at the top there. So lots of carbon means those elements forming into the list at the top 
and not forming water if it's in excess compared to oxygen. And the body of the planet, likewise, wouldn't be made of rock, would not be composed of silicon oxides, but more likely silicon carbide, graphite, and even diamond. Uh, diamond on the Earth tends to form under huge pressure lower down inside the Earth and only get brought to the surface by uh, deep mining of veins of diamonds that have resulted from uh, material being brought near enough to the surface from deep within the Earth that we can get at it. But on a carbon planet, well, it might spew diamonds out of the volcanoes, so carbon rich would the environment be. Wouldn't that be fascinating? So have we found anything? Well, if we look at the star Copernicus, 55 Cancri, to give it its uh, catalogue name, this is a double star just off the tip of Cancer. The little red oval goes around it. The main star is just a little bit smaller than the sun, just 90% of the sun's mass, and a little bit cooler at 5,172 degrees Kelvin, but older, 6.8 billion, uh, sorry, 8.6 billion years old. Now, it has a companion, a red dwarf star, 0.26 solar masses, and that may also be double, but that's not really part of our story. What is, is the fact that Copernicus, the A star, has a system of planets, and these have been given names recently. They've been named after various scientific figures. This was the first solar system to be discovered where you had an organization of a number of planets all orbiting around a relatively sun-like star, hence the name Copernicus for his uh, discovery and announcement of the heliocentric model of the solar system. It seems entirely appropriate. But the planets are called Janssen, Galileo, Brahe, Harriet and Lippehe. Uh, you may have heard of some of these. Um, Galileo, of course, in astronomy. Brahe, as in Tycho Brahe, who did such excellent work mapping the heavens. And then we have Harriet and Lippehe as well, inventors. Um, but I'm going to concentrate first on the planets and then look at Janssen. So this is an artist's representation of those planets, showing them in order. So the innermost one on the left there, Janssen, is a super Earth with eight times the mass of the Earth. So bigger than the Earth, but not as massive as Uranus or Neptune. Then we have the next three, which are Saturn mass planets of varying density. You can see Galileo is bigger, but nevertheless, the mass of these is less than the mass of Jupiter. And then the outermost one, Lippehe, is a super Jupiter. It's about three times the mass of Jupiter. Being further away, it's colder, and so the envelope has expanded less, which is why the radius is not as great as you might expect. But we're going to talk about Janssen. And 55 Cancri E, Janssen, well, eight times the mass of the Earth in double the radius. Uh, that's uh, fairly similar to the density of the Earth then, because uh, double the radius gives you eight times the volume, and, well, you have eight times the mass. So quite similar in overall density. But it's orbiting immensely close to the star and scorching hot on the surface. The temperature is about 3,000 Kelvin, enough to make it glow red. 2150 degrees centigrade. And it was initially thought that it was in a 2.8 day orbit around the star. But in fact, proper analysis and the discovery of a transit or a series of transit events where it was passing in front of the star. So we're lucky that these guys are orbiting around in a manner that's lined up with our line of sight was able to reveal a very short orbit indeed of just 17.8 hours, three quarters of a day. And it was the most telescope uh, illustrated here, which um, I don't know, it reminds me of SpongeBob, uh, but there you go. Perhaps that's what it was supposed to remind you of. So back to planet Janssen, it was 
thought originally that such an object would have a hydrogen helium envelope around it, an atmosphere, but actually it looks more like it's carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, just as predicted for a carbon planet and no sign of any water either. So that sort of backs up the idea. What they did find was hydrogen cyanide in the spectrum of the uh, gases around the planet. And again, pointing to the fact that there is an excess of carbon. So this could well be the first proper discovery of a true carbon planet. Absolutely searing hot um, and uh, thoroughly nasty place to, to visit, I would have thought. Uh, but I just wanted to answer the question that pops out of this, which is, who is Janssen anyway? And uh, Janssen was a Dutch spectacle maker. And there are claims going around that he invented the telescope and that he invented the microscope. But I'm afraid these are most likely a fraud put about by his son later to try to grab the credit. Turns out that uh, Janssen lived next door to uh, a guy that probably invented some of these optical instruments and may well have pinched the idea. Um, and then his son put it, put it about that he'd invented it. Now, we also know that Janssen Sr. was a bit of a crook. He was arrested for counterfeiting of currency um, and had to run away and then set up shop again, counterfeiting more coinage, um, and got found out for that, um, and uh, there was a whole hoo-ha about it. So I'm not sure we should be naming a planet after this guy, but there you go. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll be back with more on another occasion.